Hey, Mark, sit down. It's great to have you here. Welcome. Thanks for flying down. Yeah, no, this will be fun. Are you have been going for like five hours already or something? Well, yeah, sure. <laughs> no, this is SIGGRAPH, you know, these 90% PhDs. So the thing that's really great about SIGGRAPH, as you know, this is the show of computer graphics, image processing, artificial intelligence, and robotics combined. And some of the companies that over the years have demonstrated and revealed amazing things here from Disney, Pixar, Adobe, Epic Games, and of course, you know, NVIDIA, we've done a lot of work here. This year, uh, we introduced 20 papers at the intersection of artificial intelligence and simulation. So we're using artificial intelligence to do help simulation be way larger scale, way faster. For example, uh, differentiable physics. Uh, we're using simulation to create uh, simulation environments for synthetic data generation for artificial intelligence. And so these two areas is re are really coming together. Um, really proud of the work that we've done here at Meta. Uh, you guys have done amazing AI work. I mean, one of the things that, that I find amusing is uh, when the press writes about how Meta's jumped into AI this last couple of years, um, as if, you know, the, the work that, that FAIR has done. Uh, remember, we all use PyTorch. That comes out of Meta. The work that you do in computer vision, the, the work in uh, language models, real-time translation, uh, groundbreaking work. I guess my first question for you is, how do you see the uh, advances of generative AI at Meta today, and how do you apply it to either enhance your operations or introduce new capabilities that you're offering? Yeah, so a oh, lot to unpack there. First of all, really happy to be here. You know, Meta has done a lot of work and uh, has, has been at SIGGRAPH for you know, eight years. So I mean, it's a, you know, we're noobs compared to, to you guys. But um, you know, I think it was back in, in 2018. You're dressed right, but this is my hood. I just want you know, it's I mean, well, thank you for welcoming me to your hood. Um, <laughs> you know, I think it was back in 2018, we, we showed the, some of the early hand tracking work on, um, for our VR and mixed reality headsets. And you know, I think we've talked a bunch about progress that we're making on codec avatars the photorealistic avatars that we want to be able to drive from consumer headsets, which we're getting closer and closer to. So pretty excited about that. And also a lot of the display systems work that we've done. So um, some of the future prototypes and research for getting the mixed reality headsets to be able to be really thin with like with just you know, pretty advanced optical stacks and, and display systems, the, the integrated system. I and mean, that's that's been stuff that we've typically shown here first. So excited to be here, you know, this year, not just talking about the metaverse stuff, but, but also um, all the AI pieces which, as you said, I mean, we started FAIR, the AI Research Center. You know, back then it was Facebook, now Meta, uh, before we started Reality Labs. I and mean, we've been at this for, for a while. The, you know, all the stuff around Gen AI, it's, it's an interesting revolution. And, and, and I think that it's going to end up making, I think, all of the different products that we do, you know, different in, 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 in interesting ways. So, I mean, I, I kind of go through, you can look at the big product lines that we have already. So things like the, you know, feed and recommendation systems and Instagram and Facebook. And we've kind of been on this journey where that's gone from just being about connecting with your friends. And the ranking was always important because you know, even when you were just, you know, following friends, you know, if, if someone did something really important, like your cousin, not a baby or something. It's like, you want that at the top. You'd be pretty angry at us if we, you know, it was buried somewhere down in your feed. Um, so the ranking was, was important, but now over the last few years, it's gotten to a point where more of that stuff is, is just different public content that's out there. The recommendation systems are super important because now instead of just a few hundred or thousand potential candidate posts from friends, there's millions of, of, of pieces of content and that turns into like a really interesting recommendation problem. And with generative AI, I think we're going to quickly move into this zone where not only is, is the majority of the content you know, that you see today on Instagram you know, just recommended to you from kind of stuff that's out there in the world that matches your interests and whether or not you follow the people. I think in the future, a lot of the stuff is going to be created with these tools too. Some of that is going to be creators using the tools to create new content. Some of it, I think, eventually is going to be content that's either created on the fly for you or kind of pulled together and synthesized through different things that are out there. So I think that that's just one example of how kind of the core part of what we're doing is just going to evolve, and it's been evolving for for 20 years already. But I think well, that's very few gonna... people realize that that uh, one of the largest computing systems the world has ever conceived of yeah. is a recommender system. Yeah, I mean, it's this whole yeah, it's this whole different path, right? It's it's not quite the kind of Gen AI 
hotness that people talk about. But I think it's it's like as I mean, it's all the transformer architectures, and it's this, a similar thing of just building up more and more general models, embedding embedding unstructured data into features. And yeah, I mean, one of the big things that just drives quality improvements is you know it used to be that you'd have a different model for each type of content, right? So a, a recent example is you know we had you know one model for ranking and recommending reels, and another model for ranking and recommending more long form videos, and then you know it takes some product work to basically make it so that the system can display you know anything in line but you know the more you kind of just create more general recommendation models that can span everything mm -hmm. it just gets better and better so i mean part of it i think is just like economics and liquidity of content and the broader of a pool that you can pull from you're, you're just not having these weird inefficiencies of pulling from different pools but yeah i mean as the models get bigger and more general that gets better and better so yeah. i, I kind of dream of one day like you can almost imagine all of facebook or instagram being you know like a single ai model that is uniform all these different content types and systems together that actually have different objectives over different time frames, right? Because some of it is just showing you, you know, what's the interesting content that you're going to be, that, that you want to see today. But some of it is helping you build out your network over the long term, right? People you may know or accounts you might want to follow. And these, these multimodal models yeah. tend to be, yeah. tend to be much better at recognizing patterns, weak yeah. signals and such. And yeah. so one of the things that people, people always, you know, it's so interesting that AI has been so deep in your company. You've been building GPU infrastructure running these large recommender systems for a long time now yeah. you're now I'm you're a little slow on it actually getting to gpus yeah i was trying to be nice i know well you know too nice I was trying to be nice, you know. Well, you're, well, you're my I, guest. You know, when I was backstage before I came on here, you were talking about like owning your mistakes or something, right? So <laughs> you don't have to volunteer it out of the blue. <laughs> I, I think this one has been well trod. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. like I got raked over. But the as soon as you got into it, you while, got, you know? as soon as you got into it, you got into it strong. Let's just I mean, put yeah, it. Uh, yeah. There you go. There you go. That's how we roll. Now, now the thing that's really cool about generative AI is these days when I use WhatsApp, I feel like I'm collaborating with WhatsApp. I love Imagine. I'm sitting here typing, and it's generating the images as I'm going. Yeah. I go back and I change my words. It's generating other images. Yeah. You know, and and so the, the one that old Chinese guy enjoying a glass of whiskey at sundown with three dogs, golden retriever, golden doodle, and a Bernese mountain dog. And it generates, you know, a pretty good Real looking time. picture. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're cool. getting there. That's me. Yeah, every month. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then now you could actually load my picture in there. Yeah. No, I should be me. Yeah, that's as of last week. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah super yeah. excited about that. Now imagine me. Yeah, no, I'm spending a lot of time with my daughters imagining them as mermaids and things over the last um, over the last week. It's been it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. But yeah, I mean that's that's the other half of it. I mean the a lot of the Gen AI stuff is going to on the one hand it's I think going to just be this big upgrade for all of the workflows and products that we've had for a long time. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, there's going to be all these completely new things that can now get created. So meta AI, you know, the, the idea of having, you know, just an, an AI assistant that can help you with different tasks and in, in our world is going to be you know, very creatively oriented, like you're saying, but but I mean, they're very general. So I mean, you don't need to just constrain it to that. It'll be able to answer any question. Over time, I think, you know, when we move from like the Llama 3 class of models to Llama 4 and beyond, it's um, it's gonna, I think, feel less like a chatbot where it's like you you give it a, a, a prompt and it just responds, and then you give it a prompt and it responds, and it's just like back and forth. I think it's gonna pretty quickly evolve to you give it an intent and it actually can go away on multiple time frames. And I mean, it probably should acknowledge that you gave it an intent up front. But I mean, you know, some of the stuff I think will end up, you know, it'll spin up, you know, compute jobs that take weeks or months or something and then just come back to you when like something happens in the world. And I think that that's going to be really powerful. So I mean, I'm Today's I'm AI, as that. you as you know, is kind of turn-based. You say something, it says something back to you. Um, but obviously, when we think, when we're given a mission or we're giving a problem, you know, we'll, we'll contemplate multiple options or maybe we come up with a, you know, a tree of options, a decision tree, and we walk down to the decision tree simulating in our mind, you know, what are the different outcomes of each decision that we could potentially make? And so we were doing planning. And so in the future, AIs will, will kind of do the same. One of the things that, yeah. that I was super excited about when you talked about your vision of creator AI, mm -hmm. I just think that's that's a home run idea, frankly. Tell everybody about the creator AI and AI studio that's going to enable you to do that. Yeah, so so we actually, I mean, this is something that we're, we're you know, we've talked about it a bit, but we're rolling it out a, a lot wider today. You know, a lot of our vision is that I don't 
don't think that there's just going to be like one AI model, right? I mean, this is something that some of the other companies in the industry, they're like, you know, it's like they're building like one central agent and, and yeah, we'll, we'll have the meta AI assistant that you can use, but a lot of our vision is that we want to empower all the people who use our products to basically create agents for themselves. So whether that's, you know, all the many, many millions of creators that are on the platform or you know, hundreds of millions of small businesses, um, we eventually want to just be able to pull in all your content and very quickly stand up a business agent and um, be able to interact with your customers and you know, do sales and customer support and all that. So the one that we're, that we're just starting to roll out more now is um, we call it AI Studio. And it basically is uh, a set of tools that eventually is going to make it so that every creator can build sort of an AI version of themselves as, as sort of an, an, an agent or an assistant that, that their community can interact with. There's kind of a fundamental issue here where there's, there's just not enough hours in the day, right? It's like if you're, if you're a creator, you want to engage more with your community, but you're constrained on time. And similarly, your community wants to engage with you, but it's tough. I mean, there's, there's just there's a limited time to do that. So the next best thing is, is allowing people to basically create these artifacts, right? It's, um, it's sort of, it's an agent, but it's, you train it to kind of, on, on your material to represent you in the way that you want. I think it, it's it's a very kind of creative endeavor, almost like a like a piece of, of art or content that you're putting out there. And it's, it's gonna be very clear that it's not engaging with the creator themselves, but I think it'll be another interesting way, just like how creators put out content on, on these uh, social systems to be able to have agents that do that. Similarly, I think that there's gonna be a thing where people basically create their own agents for all different kinds of uses. Some will be sort of customized utility, things that they're trying to get done that they wanna kind of fine tune and, and train agent for. Some of them will be entertainment and some of the things that people create are just funny you know, and, and just kind of silly in different ways or, or kind of have a funny attitude about things that um, you know, we probably couldn't, we, we probably wouldn't build into meta AI as an assistant, but, but I think people, people are, are kind of pretty interested to see um, and interact with. And then one of the interesting use cases that we're seeing is people kind of using these agents for support. This was one thing that, that was a little bit surprising to me is one of the top use cases for meta AI already is people basically using it to role play difficult social situations that they're going to be in. So whether it's a professional situation, it's like, all right, I want to ask my manager, like, how do I get a promotion or a raise? Or I'm having this fight with my friend or I'm having this difficult situation with my girlfriend. Like, how, ha like, how can this conversation go? And basically having a, like, a completely judgment-free zone where you can basically role play that and see how, how, how the conversation will go and, and get feedback on it. But I, a lot of people, they don't just want to interact with the same kind of, you know, agent, whether it's meta AI or chat GPT or whatever it is that everyone else is using, they want to kind of create their own thing. So that's, that's roughly where we're going with AI Studio, but it's all part of this bigger, I, I guess, view that we have that there shouldn't just be kind of one big AI that people interact with. We, we, we just think that the world will be better and more interesting if there's a diversity of these different things. I just think it's so cool that if you're an artist and you have a style, you could take your style, all of your body of work, you could fine tune yeah. one of your models, yeah. and now this becomes uh, an AI model that you can come and you could prompt it. You could ask me to uh, you know, create something along the lines of the art style that I have, and you might even give me a piece of art as a, make a drawing, a sketch as an inspiration, and I can generate something for you. And, it's, and you, come to, my, you know, come to my bot for that, uh, yeah. come to my AI for that. It could be, it could be a, uh, every, single, uh, every single restaurant, every single website will probably in the future have these AIs. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of think that in the future, just like every business has you know, an email address and a website and a social media account, or several. I think in the future, every business is going to have an AI agent that interfaces yeah. with their customers. And right. Some of these things I think have been pretty hard to do historically. Like, um, if you think about any company, it's like you probably have customer support is just a separate organization from sales. And that's not really how you'd want it to work as CEO. It's just that, okay, they're kind of different skills. You're building up these. I'm large... your customer support, just to be. What's up? You I'm are? your. Yeah, well, you, you... apparently I am. Yeah. I mean, well, I guess, <laughs> as, whenever Mark needs something, as, just, as CEO, you, 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 I can't tell yeah, whether it's sure. chatbot or it's. Yeah, Mark, but he no, just it's just my chat bot. Just asking you. Um, no, well, I guess that's kind of yeah. When you're CEO, you have to do all the stuff. But but I mean, then when you build the abstraction into your organization, a lot yeah. of times, like the you know, in general, the organizations are separate because they're kind of optimized for different things. But that's right. I think like the platonic ideal of this would be that it's kind of one thing, right? As a you know, as a customer, you don't really care. You know, you don't want to like have a different route when you're trying to buy something versus if you're having an issue with something that you bought. You just want to have a place that you can go and get your questions answered and be able to um, engage with the business in different yeah. ways. And I think that that applies 
applies for creators too. I think that the, the kind of personal consumer side of this and is going to be... And all of that engagement with your customers, especially their complaints, is going to make your company better. Yeah, totally. Right? Yeah. The fact that it's all engaging with this AI is going to capture yeah. the, the, uh, the institutional knowledge yeah. and, how to, and all of that can go into analytics, which improves the AI and so on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. So the business version of this is um, that I think has a little more integration and we're still in, in a pretty early alpha with that. But the AI studio making it so people can kind of create their UGC agents and, and different things and getting started on this flywheel of having creators create them. I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. And can, so can I can I use AI studio to fine tune with my images, my collection of images? Yeah, you're, okay. yeah we're going to get there. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. then I could, can I give it, load it? All the things that I've written, so that you use it, use it as my rag. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah, basically. Okay. Yeah. And then yeah, every and time I come back to it, it loads up its memory again, so it remembers where it left off last time. Yep. And we carry our our conversation as as if nev nothing ever happened. Yeah, and, and, and look, I mean, like any product, it'll get better over time. The tools yeah. for training it will get better. It's not just about what you want it to say. I mean, I think generally creators and businesses have topics that they want to stay away from too, right? So just getting better at all this stuff. You know, I think the platonic version of this is not just text, mm -hmm. right? You, you almost want to just be able to, and this is sort of an intersection with some of the codec avatar work that we're doing over time. You want to basically be able to have almost like a video chat with, with, the, with, the, with the agent. And I, I think we'll get there over time. I don't think that this yeah. stuff is that far off, but the, um, the flywheel is spinning really quickly. So uh, it's, it's, it's exciting. There is a lot of new stuff to build. And I, I think even if the progress on the foundation models kind of stopped now, which I don't think it will, I think we'd have like five years of product innovation for the industry to basically figure out how to most effectively use all the stuff that's gotten built so far. But I actually just think the, the kind of foundation models and the progress on the fundamental research is accelerating. So, um, so that it's a, it's a pretty wild time. Your vision and of- It's all, it's all um, you know, in, in you kind of made this happen. So, Why, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> In the last conversation, I, I <laughs> thank you. CEOs, we're, we're delicate flowers. We need a lot of back. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, we're, we're pretty grizzled at this point. I think we're, we're the two kind of longest standing founders in the industry. It's right? true. It's, I mean, it's true. I mean, it's true. It's true. <laughs> I just. <laughs> and your hair has gotten gray. Mine has just gotten longer. <laughs> <laughs> no, mine's gotten gray. Yours gotten curly. What's up? It was always curly. That's oh, why I okay. kept it short. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if I had known it was going to take so long to succeed, you would never would have started. No, I would have dropped out of college just like you. <laughs> no. Get a head start. Well, that's a, yeah, that's a good difference between our personalities. Yeah. I, I think that these things. You got a twelve-year so head start. That's yeah. pretty good. That's pretty good. You know, you're doing pretty well. Uh, I'm gonna. <laughs> I'm going to be able to carry on. Let me just put it that way. <laughs> so um, the, the thing that I love about your vision of that everybody can have an AI, that every business can have an AI. In our company, I want every engineer and every software developer to have an AI and, or many AIs. Uh, the thing that's, that I love about your vision is you also believe that everybody and every company should be able to make their own AI. So you actually open sourced. Uh, when you open sourced Llama, I thought that was great. Llama 2.1, by the way, I, I thought Llama 2 was probably the biggest event in AI last year. And the reason for that... I mean, I it, thought it was the H100, but, you know, it's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a chicken or the egg question. That's a chicken we or the egg our question. Parts. Yeah, which came first? H100. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, Llama 2 it was, it was actually not the H100. Yeah, it was uh, A100. Yeah, yeah. yeah, thank you. And so, so um, but the reason why I said it was the biggest event was because when that came out, it activated every company, every enterprise, and every industry. All of a sudden, every healthcare company was building AIs, every company was building AI, every large company, small company, startups were, were building AIs. It made it possible for every researcher to be able to re-engage AI again because they have a starting point to do something with. Um, and, uh, and, and then now... Uh, 3.1 is out, and the excitement. Just so you know, uh, you know we're, we're, we work together to to uh, uh, deploy uh, 3.1. We're taking it out to the world's enterprise, and the excitement is just off the charts. And and I I think it's going to enable all kinds of applications. But tell tell me about your your open source philosophy. Where did that come from? And you know you open source PyTorch, and that it is now the framework by which AI is done. And uh, now you've open sourced Llama 3.1 or Llama. Uh, there's a whole ecosystem built around it, and so I, I think it's terrific. But where did that all come from? Yeah, so there's a, there's a bunch of 
history on, on a lot of this. I mean, we've done a lot of open source work over time. I think part of it, you know, just bluntly is, you know, we got started after some of the other tech companies, right, in building out stuff like the distributed computing infrastructure and, and the data centers. And, you know, because of that, by the time that we built that stuff, it wasn't a competitive advantage. So we're like, all right, we might as well make this open. And then we'll benefit from the, from the ecosystem around that. So we, we had a bunch of projects like that. I think the biggest one was probably Open Compute, where mm -hmm. we took our server designs and the network designs and eventually the data center designs and published all of that. And by having that become somewhat of an industry standard, all the supply chains basically got or organized around it, which had this benefit of saving money for everyone. So by making it public um, and open, we basically have saved billions of dollars from doing that well, work. Well, Open Compute was also what made it possible for NVIDIA HGXs that we designed for one data center all of a sudden it works in yeah works in yeah. every data center awesome yeah. um, so so we so that was an awesome experience and then you know we've done it with a bunch of our kind of infrastructure tools things like react pytorch um, so I'd say by the time that Llama came around, we were sort of positively predisposed towards doing this. For for AI models specifically, I guess there's a few ways that I look at this. I mean, one is, you know, it's been really fun building stuff over the last 20 years at the company. One of the things that, that has been sort of the most difficult has been kind of having to navigate the fact that we ship our apps through our competitors' mobile platforms. Mm -hmm. So in the one hand, the mobile platforms have been this huge boon to the industry, that's been awesome. Um, on the other hand, having to deliver your products through your competitors is challenging, right? And, and I also, you know, I grew up in a time where, you know, the first version of Facebook was on the web and that was open. And then, you know, as a transition to mobile, you know, the plus side of that was, you know, now everyone has a computer in their pocket, so that's great. The downside is, okay, we're a lot more restricted in what we can do. So when you look at these generations of computing, there's this big recency bias where everyone just looks at mobile and thinks, okay, because the closed ecosystem, because Apple basically won and set the, the terms of that, and like, yeah, I know that there's more Android phones out there technically, but like, Apple basically has the whole market um, and, and, and like all the profits, and, and basically Android is kind of following Apple in, in terms of the development of it. So I think Apple pretty clearly won this generation. But it's not always like that, right? I mean, if you go back a generation, you know, Apple was doing their, their kind of closed thing, but Microsoft, which was, you know, it's, it obviously isn't like this perfectly open company, but, you know, compared to, to, to Apple with Windows running on all the different OEMs and different software, uh, d different, different hardware, was a much more open ecosystem. And Windows, Windows was the leading ecosystem. It, it, um, you know, it, it basically, in the kind of PC generation of things, the open ecosystem won. And I am kind of hopeful that in the next generation of computing, we're gonna to return to a zone where the open ecosystem wins and is the leading one again. There will always be a closed one and an open one. I think that there's reasons to do both. There are benefits to both. I'm not like a zealot on this. I mean, we do closed source stuff. I'm not everything that we, that we publish is open. But I think in general for the computing platforms that the whole industry is building on, there's a lot of value for that if the software especially is open. So that's really shaped my philosophy on this. And um, for both AI with Llama and with the work that we're doing in AR and VR, where we are basically making the Horizon OS that we're building for mixed reality an, an open operating system in the sense of, of kind of what Android or well, Windows was and, and basically making it so that like we're gonna be able to work with lots of different hardware companies to make all different kinds of, of devices. We basically just wanna return the ecosystem to that level where that, that's gonna be the open one. And, and I, I, I'm pretty optimistic that in the next generation, the open ones are going to win. For, for us specifically, you know, I just want to make sure that we have access to, I mean, this is sort of selfish, but it's, you know, after building this company for a while, one of my things for the next 10 or 15 years is like, I just want to make sure that we can build the fundamental technology that we're going to be building social experiences on because there have just been too many things that I've tried to build and then have just been told, nah, you can't really build that by the platform provider that at some level, I'm just like, nah, fuck that. For the next generation, um, like we're going to go build like all, all, all the way down and, and make sure that-, that There we goes can... our broadcast opportunity. Yeah, no, sorry, sorry. Um, Hang on a like, beep. Yeah, you know, uh, we were doing okay for like 20 minutes, but <laughs> give, me, give me talking about closed platforms and I get angry. Um, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Hey, look, it, it is great. I think it's a great world where, where there are people who are dedicated uh, to build the best possible AIs, however they build it, and they, make, they, they offer it to the world um, you know, as a service. And then, but if you want to build your own AI, you could still also build your own AI. So the ability yeah, totally. to, right, to use an AI, you know, there's a lot of stuff. I, I prefer not to make this jacket myself. 
I prefer to have this jacket made for me. You know oh. what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. But so the fact that so the fact that leather could be open source is not a useful concept for me. But but I, I think the the idea that you could you could have great services, incredible services, as well as open service, open ability. Yeah. Then then we basically have the entire spectrum. But the the thing that's you, you did with 3.1 that was really great was you have 405B, you have 70B, you have 8B. You could you could use it for synthetic data generation. Use the larger models to essentially teach the smaller models. And although the larger models will be more general, um, it'll, it's less brittle. Uh, you could you could still build a smaller model that fits in you know whatever operating domain or operating cost that you would like to have. Uh, you you uh, meta guard, I think. Yeah, llama guard. Uh, yeah. Llama guard. Uh, llama guard for guard railing, fantastic. Um, and so now, and the way that that you built the model, uh, it's built in a transparent way. It's uh, has. You dedicate You've got a world-class safety team, world-class ethics team. Uh, you could build it in such a way that everybody knows it's built properly. And so I really love that part of it. Yeah, and I mean, just to finish the thought from from before uh, before I got I got sidetracked there for a detour. You know, I do think there's this alignment where, I and mean, we're building it because we want the thing to exist, and we want to knock it cut off from some closed model, right? And but it. This isn't just like a piece of software that you can build. It's you know you need an ecosystem around right. it, and so it's it's almost like it it kind of almost wouldn't even work that well if we didn't open source it, right? It's it's not we're not doing this because we're kind of altruistic people, um, even though I, I think that this is going to be helpful for the ecosystem, and we're doing it because we think that this is going to make the thing that we're building the best by by kind of having a robust ecosystem. Well, look, around. look how many people contributed to PyTorch ecosystem. Yeah, totally. Mountains of engineering. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, in video alone, we probably have a couple of hundred people just dedicated to making PyTorch better and scalable and you know more performant and so on and so forth. Constantly. Yeah, and it's it's also just when something becomes something of an industry standard, other folks do work around it, right? So, like all of the silicon and the systems will end up being optimized to run this thing really well, which will benefit everyone, but it will also work well with the system that we're building. And that's I think just one example of how this ends up being just being really effective. So yeah, I mean, I think that the open source strategy is going to be yeah, is fantastic. going to be a good one as a business strategy. I think people still don't quite. Well, get... we b we love it so much. We built an ecosystem around it. We built this thing yeah, called you guys AI have been Foundry. Awesome on this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you guys have been awesome on yeah, this. I we... mean, every time we're shipping something, you guys are the first to to release this and, and optimize it and make it work. And so, I mean, I, I appreciate that. What can what can I say? We have good engineers, you know. <laughs> and, and so, and and well, you always just jump on this stuff quickly too. So. Well, yeah. I, you know, I'm, I'm a Very senior, I'm senior citizen, but I'm agile. You know, that's what CEOs have to do. Um, and, and I recognize an important thing. I recognize an important thing. And, and I, I think that Llama is, is genuinely important. We built this concept to call an AI factory, uh, AI foundry around it, uh, so that we can help everybody build. Take, you know, a lot of people, they, they, they have a desire to uh, build AI. And it's very important for them to own the AI because once they put that into their, their flywheel, their data flywheel, that's how their company's institutional knowledge yep. is encoded and embedded into an, an AI. So they can't afford to have the AI flywheel, the data flywheel, that experience flywheel somewhere else. So, and, and so open source allows them to do that. But they, they don't really know how to turn this whole thing into an AI. And so we created this thing called an AI foundry. We provide the tooling. We provide the expertise. Uh, Llama uh, technology. Uh, we have the ability to help them uh, turn this whole thing uh, into an AI service. And and then when, when we're done with that, uh, they take it, they own it. We, the output of it's what we call a NIM. And this NIM, this, this Neuro Micro NVIDIA Inference Microservice, uh, they just download it, they take it, and they run it anywhere they like, including on-prem. And we have a whole ecosystem of partners uh, from OEMs that can run the NIMs to uh, GSIs like Accenture that, that uh, we've trained and worked with to create Llama-based NIMs and, and uh, pipelines. And, and now we're, we're off helping enterprises all over the world do this. I mean, it's really quite an ex exciting thing. It's really all triggered off of uh, the Llama open sourcing. Yeah, I think especially the ability to help people distill their own models from the big model yeah. is going to be a really valuable new thing. Because I, I, there's this, you know, just like we talked about on the product side, how at least I don't think that there's going to be like one major AI agent that everyone talks to. It's at the same level, I don't think that there's going to necessarily be one model that everyone uses. We have a chip AI, chip design AI. 
Yeah. We have a software coding AI, and our software coding AI understands uh, USD because we code in USD for for Omniverse stuff. Um, uh, we have uh, software AI that understands Verilog, our Verilog. We have uh, we have software AI that understands our bugs database and knows how to help us triage bugs and sends it to the right engineers. And so each one of these AIs are fine tuned off of Llama, and and so we fine tune them, we guardrail them. You know, if we if we have a if we have a uh, an AI design uh, for for uh, uh, for chip design, uh, we're not interested in asking it about politics, you know, and religion and things like that. So we guardrail it. And so so I think I think every company will essentially have, for every single function that they have, uh, they will likely have AIs that are built for that. And they need help to do that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of the big questions is going to be in the future, to what extent are people just using the kind of the bigger, more sophisticated models versus just training their own models for the uses that they have? And at least I, I would bet that they're going to be just a... a just vast proliferation of yeah. different models. People, we use the largest ones, and the reason for that is because our engineers are their times are so valuable, mm -hmm. and so we get uh, right now we're getting 405B uh, optimized for performance, and as you know, uh, 405B doesn't fit in any GPU, no matter how big, and so that's why the NVLink performance is so important. We have this every one of our GPUs connected by this uh, non-blocking switch called NVLink switch, and um, uh, in the HGX, for example, there are two of those switches, and we make it possible for all these all these GPUs to work and, and um, uh, run the 405Bs really performant. The reason why we do it is because the, the engineer's times are so valuable to us. You know, we want to use the best possible model. The fact that it's cost effective by a few pennies, who cares? So we, we, we just want to make sure that the best quality of result is presented to them. Yeah, well, I mean, the 405, I think, is about half the cost to inference of the GPT-40 model. So, I mean, at that level, it's already, I mean, it's, it's pretty good. But yeah, I mean, I think people are doing stuff on devices or want smaller models. They're just going to distill it down. So that's like a whole whole different set of services. That AI is running, and let's let's pretend for a second that we're hiring that AI. That AI for chip design is probably $10 an hour if you're using it constantly and you're sharing that AI across a whole bunch of engineers. So each engineer probably has an AI that's sitting sitting with them that doesn't cost, you know, doesn't cost very much. And we pay the engineers a lot of money. And so, so to us, a few dollars an hour amplifies the capabilities of somebody that's really valuable. I mean... You don't need to convince me. If you haven't, if you haven't, if you haven't hired an AI, do it right away. <laughs> That's all we're saying. So um, let's talk about let's talk about um, the next the next wave. Um, you know, one of the things that I really love about the work that you guys do, computer vision. Uh, one of the models that we use a lot internally is segment everything. And you know that that we're now training AI models on video so that we can understand the world model. Now, our use case, our use case is for robotics and, and uh, industrial uh, digitalization and connecting these AI models into Omniverse so that we can model and represent the physical world better, uh, have robots that operate in these Omniverse worlds better. Uh, your your application, the, the Ray-Ban Metaglass, uh, your vision for, for uh, bringing AI into the virtual world uh, is really interesting. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, okay, a lot to unpack in there. The segment anything model that, that you're talking about, we're actually presenting, I think, the next version of that here at, at, at SIGGRAPH, segment anything two, and it is, it now works, it's faster, it works with, uh, here we go, it works in video now as well. I think these are actually cattle from my ranch in Kauai. Um, but By the way, these are, what they're called delicious, Mark's cow. Delicious cows. Delicious yeah. Mark's um, there you go. Yeah, another. Next time we do, so Mark Mark came up to my house and we made Philly cheesesteak together. Next time you're bringing the. I'd cow. say you did. I was more of a sous chef, <laughs> but, but, you, Boy, that, but it was really good. It was really good. That sous chef comment. Okay, listen. And so, then at the end of the night, though, you were like, "Hey, so you 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 ate enough, right?" And I was like, "I don't know. I could eat another one." You're like, "Really?" <laughs> You know, usually when you say something like you were being to your polite. guest, I was definitely like, "Yeah, we're making more. We're making more cheese." Did you get enough to eat? Usually, your <laughs> guest says, "Oh yeah, that, I'm, I'm fine." Make me another cheesesteak, Jensen. <laughs> <laughs> So just to let you know how OCD he is, so I turn around, I'm, I'm <laughs> prepping the, the, the cheesesteak, and I said, Mark, cut the tomatoes. And so, so uh, Mark, I handed him a knife. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a precision cutter. And so he cuts, he cuts the, uh, the tomatoes. Every single one of them are perfectly to the exact millimeter. But the, the really interesting thing is I was expecting all the tomatoes to be sliced and kind of stacked up, kind of like a, a deck of cards. And, uh, but when I turned around, he said he needed another, another plate. And the reason for that was because all of the tomatoes he cut, none of them 
touched each other. Once he separates one slice of tomato from the other tomato, they shall not touch again. Yeah, look, man, if you wanted them to touch, you needed to tell me that, right? You need, that's why I'm just a sous chef, okay? That's why he needs an AI that doesn't judge. <laughs> yeah, it's like... So, this is super cool. Okay, so it's recognizing the cows, track. it's recognizing tracking the cows. Yeah. Yeah, so it's um, a lot of fun effects will be able to be made with this, and because it'll be open, a lot of more serious applications across the industry too. So, yeah. I mean, scientists use this stuff to you know, study coral reefs and natural habitats and in kind of evolution of landscapes and things like that. But I mean, it's uh, being able to do this in video and having it be a zero shot and be able to kind of interact with it and tell it what you want to track is, um, it's pretty cool research. So, so for example, the reason why we use it, uh, for example, you have a warehouse and it's got a whole bunch of cameras and the warehouse AI uh, is watching everything that's going on and let's say a uh, you know, a stack of boxes fell, uh, or somebody spilt water on the ground, um, or you know, what, whatever accident is about to happen. The AI recognizes it, generates the text, send it to somebody, and you know, you know uh, help will come along the way. And so that's one way of using it. Uh, instead of recording everything, if there's an accident, instead of recording every nanosecond of video and then going back and re retrieve that moment, it just re it just records the important stuff because it knows what it's looking at. And so, so I, having a video understanding model, video language model is really, really powerful for all, all these, these interesting applications. Now, wh what, else, what else are you guys going to work on beyond? Talk, talk to me about... Uh, yes, yeah, so there's all the smart glasses, yeah. right? So I think when, when we think about the next computing platform, you know, we, we kind of break it down into mixed reality, the headsets, and smart glasses. And the smart glasses, I think it's easier for people to wrap their head around that and wearing it because it's, you know, pretty much everyone who's wearing a pair of glasses today yeah. will end up, that'll get upgraded to smart glasses, and that's like more than a billion people in the world. So that's going to be a pretty big thing. The VR MR headsets, I think some people find it interesting for gaming or different uses, some don't yet. My view is that they're going to be both in the world. I think the smart glasses are going to be sort of the mobile phone, kind of always on version of the next computing platform. And the mixed reality headsets are going to be more like your workstation or your game console, where when you're sitting down for a more immersive session, you want access to more compute. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, I mean, the glasses are just very small form factor. There are going to be a lot of constraints on that, just like you can't do the same level of computing on a phone. It, it came at exactly the time when all of these breakthroughs in generative AI happened. Yeah, so we, we basically, really for smart amazing. glasses, we've been, we've been going at the problem from two different directions. On the one hand, we've been building what we think is sort of the technology that you need for the kind of ideal holographic AR glasses. And we're doing all the custom silicon work, all the custom display stack work, like all the stuff that you would need to do to make that work. And they're glasses, right? It's not a headset. It's not like a VR or MR headset. They look like glasses. They're still quite a bit far off from the glasses that you're wearing now. I mean, those are very thin. But um, but even even the Ray-Bans that we, that we make, you couldn't quite fit all the tech that you need to into that yet for kind of full holographic AR. Though we're getting close, and over the next few years, I think we'll We'll basically get closer. It'll still be pretty expensive, but but I think that'll start to be a product. The other angle that we've come at this is let's start with good-looking glasses by partnering with the best glasses maker in the world, Essilor Luxottica. They basically make they have all all the big brands that you use. Um, you know, it's Ray-Ban or Oakley or Oliver Peoples or just uh, like a handful of others. NVIDIA it's of it's kind of all Essilor Luxottica. The Nvidia of glasses. I, I think hmm. that you know it's. Uh, I think they would probably like that analogy. But um, <laughs> I mean, who wouldn't? Who wouldn't at this point? We've been working with them on on the Ray-Bans. We're on the second generation, mm -hmm. and the goal there has been okay. Let's constrain the form factor to just something that looks great. Great idea. And within that, let's put in as much technology as we can understanding that we're not going to get to the kind of ideal of what we want to fit into it technically but it'll it'll but at the end it'll be like great looking glasses and we at this point we have we have camera sensors so you can, you can take photos and videos you can actually live stream to Instagram you can take video calls on WhatsApp and stream to the other person you know what you're seeing you can I mean it has it has a microphone and speaker so I mean the speaker's actually really, really good, good it's, speakers. it's like it's open ear so yeah, really you know, a lot of people speakers. find it more comfortable than than earbuds yeah. um, you can listen to music and it's just like this private experience that's pretty neat. People love that. You take phone calls on it. But then it just turned out that that sensor package was exactly what you needed to be able to talk to AI too. Yeah, so right. that was sort of an accident. If you'd asked me five years ago, were we going to get holographic AR before AI? I would have said, yeah, probably. Right. I mean, it's, it just seems like kind of the graphics progression and the display progression right, yeah. on all the virtual and mixed reality stuff and building up the new display stack. We were just making continual progress towards that. And then this breakthrough happened yeah, with right. LLMs. Yeah. And it turned out that we have sort of really high quality AI now yeah. and getting better at a really 
fast rate before you have holographic AR. So it's sort of this inversion that that I didn't really expect. I mean, we're, we're fortunately well positioned because we were working on all these different products, but I think what you're gonna end up with is um, a whole series of different potential glasses products at different price points with different levels of technology in them. So I kind of think, um, based on what we're seeing now with the Ray-Ban Metas, I, I would guess that displayless AI glasses mm -hmm. at like a $300 price point mm -hmm. are going to be a really big product that yeah. like tens of millions right. of people or hundreds of millions of people eventually are going to have. And so then, you're going to have super interactive AI that you're talking to. You yeah. Have visual, you have yeah. visual language understanding that you just showed. Mm -hmm. You have real-time translation. You could talk to me in one language. I hear in another language. Yeah, and then the display is obviously going to be great yeah. too, yeah. but it's going to add a little bit of weight to the glasses and it's going to make them more expensive. So I think mm -hmm. for there will be a lot of people who want the kind of full holographic display, but there are also going to be a lot of people for whom, you know, they, they want something that eventually is going to be like really thin glasses. And Well, for industrial applications and for some work applications, we need that. We need well, that I think for consumer display. stuff too. You think so? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you know, it's, I was thinking about this a lot during the, you know, during COVID when, when everyone kind of went remote for a bit, it's like you're spending all this time on Zoom. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, this is, it's great that we have this, but but in the future, we're, we're like not that many years away from being able to have a virtual meeting where like, you know, it's like, I'm not here physically. It's just my hologram. Yeah. And like, it just feels yeah, like yeah. we're there yeah. and we're physically present. We can yeah, work yeah. on something and collaborate yeah, on sure. something together. But I think this is going to be especially important and with AI. Application, I could live with, with a, a device that, that I'm not wearing all the time. Oh yeah, but I think we're going to get to the point where it actually is. Yeah, I could. It, it'll be, I mean, there's, with, within glasses, there's like thinner frames and there's thicker frames yeah, right. and there's there's like all these styles, but um, so I don't. I think we're we're a while away from having full holographic glasses in the form factor of your glasses. But I think having it in a pair of stylish, kind of chunkier frame glasses is not that far off. These sunglasses that are the face size these days. I could see that. Yeah, and right? and that, you know what? That that's totally um, that's good. a very helpful style trend. Yeah, for, um, exactly. That's so, a very helpful. So whoever style you know, it's like like I'm, I'm, I'm not, trying to you know, I'm, I'm trying kidding. to like yeah, make exactly. my way into becoming like a style yeah. influencer, so I can like influence this before um, you know before the glasses come to the market, but you know. Well, I can I, I see know. you it's attempting it. How's your style influencing working out for you? You know, it's early. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, it's early, it's early. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I don't know. I feel like if, you're, if, if, if a big part of the future of the business is going to be building kind of stylish glasses that yeah. people wear, this is something I should probably start paying a little more attention that's to. That's right. Right yeah. then. Totally, so yeah, totally agree. we're totally going to have to retire agree. the version of me that wore the same thing every day. But totally. I mean, that's the thing about glasses too. I, I think it's um, you know, it's unlike you know, even the watch or, or phones. Like people really do not want to all look the same. Right. And, and it's like, so I do think that it's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a platform that I think is going to lend itself going back to the theme that we talked about before towards being an open ecosystem, because I think the diversity of form factors that people and styles that people are going to demand is going to be immense. Yeah. Um, it's not like everyone is not going to want to put like the one kind of pair of glasses that, you know, whoever else designs, like that's not, I don't think that's going to fly for this. Yeah, I think that's right. Well, Mark, it's sort of incredible that we're living through a time where the entire computing stack is being reinvented. How we think about software, you know, what, what Andre calls software one and software two, and now we're basically in software three now. The way we compute um, from general purpose computing to these generative neural network processing way of doing computing, the capabilities, the applications we could develop now, unthinkable in the past. And, and this technology, generative AI, I don't remember another technology that, that in such a fast rate influenced consumers, enterprise, industries, and science. And to be able to, to cut, across, cut across all these different fields of science from, from climate tech to biotech um, uh, to uh, physical sciences, uh, in every single field that we're encountered, uh, generative AI is, is right in the middle of that. Uh, fundamental transition, and and it's and in addition to that, uh, the things that you're talking about, generative AI is going to make a, a profound impact in society. You know, the products that we're making, and one of the things that I'm su super excited about. And somebody asked me earlier, is there going to be a you know Jensen AI? Uh, well, that's exactly the creative AI you were talking about. You know, where we just build our own AIs, and I I load it up with all of the things that I've written, and and I pr I fine tune it with with uh, with the way I answer questions, and and uh, and hopefully over time the cumulative 
formulation of use, and you know, it becomes a really, really great assistant and companion for a whole lot of people who just wants to, you know, ask questions or um, bounce ideas off of, and and it'll be the version of Jensen that, as you were saying earlier, that's that's not judgmental. <laughs> You're not afraid of being judged, and so you could come and interact with it all the time. But but I, I just think I think that those those are really incredible things, and and you know, we we write we write a lot of things all the time, and and how incredible is it just to give it you know three or four topics. Now, these are the basic themes of what I want to write about and write it in my voice and just use that as a starting point. So there's there's just so many things that we can do now. Uh, it, it's really terrific working with you. And uh, I know that uh, it's not easy building a company and you pivoted yours from desktop to mobile to VR to AI, all these devices. Uh, it's it really, really, really extraordinary to watch. And NVIDIA has pivoted many times ourselves. And I know exactly how hard it is doing that. And, uh, you know, both of us have gotten kicked in our teeth a lot, plenty over the years. But that's that's what it takes to to uh, uh, to want to be a pioneer and, and innovate. So it's really great watching you. Thank you. And likewise, I mean, like it's I'm not sure if it's a pivot if you keep doing the thing you were doing before, but but as, as well, but it's but you add to it. I mean, there's more chapters to all the to, to all this, and I think the same thing for it's been fun watching. I mean, the journey that you guys have been on. I mean, just and you went we went through this period where everyone was like, nah, everything is going to kind of move to these devices, and you know, it's just going to get super kind of cheap compute, and and you guys just kept on plugging away at this, and it's like, no, like actually, you're going to want these big systems that can paralyze. We went the other work. way. Yeah, no, and it's I mean. Yeah. Yeah, we went and was, instead of building quite... smaller and smaller devices, we made computers as size unfashionable of for a while. A little unfashionable. Super unfashionable. Yeah. yeah. But now, now it's cool. And and instead of you know, we we started building a graphics chip, a GPU. And and now when you when you're deploying a GPU, you still call it Hopper H100. But it, so you guys know when Zuck calls it. H100, his data center of H100s, there's like, I think you're coming up on 600,000. And they're... We're good customers. <laughs> That's how you get the Jensen Q&A at SIGGRAPH. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, that, I was getting the Mark Zuckerberg Q&A. You were my guest. <laughs> no. And I wanted to make sure that, that You just called Mark... me one day and you're like, hey, you know, in like a couple of weeks, we're doing this thing at SIGGRAPH. I'm like, yeah, I don't think I'm doing anything that day. I'll <laughs> fly to Denver. It sounds fun. Exactly. I'm not doing anything that afternoon. You just showed up. And uh, thing, the thing is just incredible, these, these systems that you guys build. The, they're they're giant systems, incredibly hard to orchestrate, incredibly hard to run. And you know, you, you said that uh, you got into the GPU journey uh, later than than most, uh, but you're operating larger than just about anybody. And it's incredible to watch. And congratulations on everything that you've done. And uh, you you are quite the style icon now. Check check out this guy. Huh? Early stage, working on it. <laughs> working on it. It's uh... ladies and gentlemen, Mark Zuckerberg. Thank you. <laughs>